7.4%. We were in the middle of this section. We had taken a look at um, some percent problems that can be solved with proportions. And we have a couple more things we're going to take a look at in this section. The first of which is we're going to look at some mental math. All right, so we're going to solve the following problems. There are three of them. Um, I think three, maybe it's four. Three of them, four of them, it's four of them. Using mental math. So mental math means math you can do in your head. That's what it means. Um, the problem is that when I have you do mental math, I can't see what you're doing in your head unless you also write it down for me. So we're writing it down not for the purpose of using the written part to make calculations, but simply for using the written part to show what we were thinking when we did it. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's not something that should be requiring of the paper. If you're doing something you're writing down that's requiring you, the paper, to write it down, you're missing, you're missing the concept of mental math, okay? So this is an, an example. Um, both of these are really pretty good examples of what happens if you're trying to figure out um, tips or commissions. 15% and 20% happen a lot of times on tips and commissions um, for various professions. Um, or just if you're going out to eat, right? This would be something that would be useful there as well. Um, so 15%, oh, and a general rule of thumb. A general rule of thumb is it should take you three or fewer steps if you're doing it in your head. If it's taking more than three or, or fewer, if it's taking more than three, um, then it's not mental math either. You can only store so many steps in your head at the same time before it becomes something you've got to have paper to write down or something to write it down, okay? All right, so 15% is a good example of one um, that we can do with mental math. 15% breaks apart into two percentages that are really nice that we can do quickly, and that's 5% and 10%, because they add together, of course, to be 15. What can you do to do 10% in your head? What do you do? What is 10% in my head? Okay, but dividing by 10 can be done quickly. What, what do you do if you divide by 10? Thank you. Say it louder, Cassie. You move the decimal. That's exactly right. So we move the decimal. So uh, the number 42 has the decimal at the end of 42. And which way will we move it? Will, be, be, will it become 420 or will it become 40, 420? 420, right? Four and 20 cents. So when we do 10%, 10% is 420, and we're just moving the decimal. How could I then get 5% quickly? Half of that, yeah. Once I have 10%, 5% is half of that. We could use that idea, that 420, to get me 5%. So what's half of 420? 210. 210. Could you also have that done in your head? For most numbers, if it was really long or ugly, maybe not, right? But for most numbers, you could probably do that in your head. And then step number three, because we've done two steps so far, right? We've done the moving the decimal to remember 420. We've done dividing by two to remember 210. And what would we have to do? Add them together. And that's our maximum steps were sort of allowed. And we would end up at what? 630. So this is the type of written out process that you'd write to show me what you're thinking in your head. We didn't do any calculations. We're really just sort of recording what we did in these steps along the way and showing what those looked like, right? And again, how we got this one is that we halved it. <clears throat> and on this one, we moved the decimal. <clears throat> so with that in mind, how could we quickly get 20%? Two ten percent. So we would need to get ten percent first. To first, right, Kate? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is ten percent of two eighty? Twenty. Yeah, twenty eight point zero or just twenty eight, since we don't have to have that zero necessarily there. Twenty eight. And I mean, we could write down another twenty eight, and we could add them, and that'd be okay if you did that. But what else could you do? We could just multiply it by two, right? It's doubling it. So we could do this, and then we could double it. So multiply by 2. Again, 28 times 2, you, you should probably be able to do that in your head. That's 56, and it'd be $56. <clears throat> 
All right, so far so good? Okay, the next one looks similar to what we've already done. It's actually 5% of 32. How could we get 5%? Okay, so 10% and then half it. I agree. So what would 10% of 32 be? 3.2. If you want 3.20, if you prefer, that's fine. And what's half that? 1.60. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, this is like doing the 15%, but we don't have to do the addition of the two when we're done. We're just done when we halved it. So I promise I'm not like leading you down a bunny trail for the part D. Um, but if you try to do part D in the ways that we've done A through C, you are going to run into a problem. So imagine if you did it this way. You thought, okay, well, I could do 10%. Uh, and then I could double it and I could get, you know, the 5%, or I'm sorry, double it and get the 20%, right? Double for 20. Uh, and I could half it for the 5. And then I could add them all together. What's wrong with this in terms of it being mental math? Too many it's too many steps. You cannot keep this much stuff going on and make it make sense. And maybe, maybe you can. You know, maybe I, I could. Uh, but your seventh grade student could not. There's no way. I mean, they're, they're probably pushing the limits when you're asking for three steps, to be perfectly clear. Right? I mean, like, really. It's a lot of work. So this is not a good process for this, not because it's not right. It's just not following the directions of it being mental math. <coughs> so what could we do again instead? Well, think about how 25 could be, could be represented in a different form. What's another way we could represent 25%? Okay, so we could do half of 50%. So you could do half, I'm gonna write it in words actually, half and then half again. That would be two steps, wouldn't it, Jay and Ellen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could definitely do it that way. Can you think of another way you could do it? You could put it in a decimal form, you just are at that point still back to doing not mental math. Yeah, it's not that it's not a way to do it, it just doesn't fit the middle math construct, yeah. What about okay, what fraction would you use? You could use one fourth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the idea of it being one fourth works really well with the fact that we're working with 84. If the number weren't 84, it might not work quite so well. Are you with me? So the numbers you're working with play into this as well. So we're going to do it two different ways. So good job on coming up with two options. So if I did half of this, what's half of 84? 42. And what's half of that again? 21. Two steps. Clean, simple, good suggestion. One-fourth, again, working very nicely for this particular one. What is one-fourth of 84? Well, it's the same as dividing by 4. What's 8 divided by 4? 2. And 4 divided by 4? 1. So you get the same 21. Slightly different ways of doing it. The same answer is achieved. Uh, we've talked in passing about the next example already, but not directly. Um, example number seven talks about increasing and decreasing by a percent. So why is it possible to have an increase in 150% in price, but not a decrease of 150% in price? And what makes it uh, negative? Okay, so you're talking about the decrease part of it. So I believe what you're saying, Kessie, is that if I decreased it by 150%, I would end up with a negative number. Yeah. Does that sound fair? Yeah. So why did that happen? Why, why would it be negative? Because 150 is more than 100%. Yeah, so if we decreased it 100%, what would happen? It would be zero. 
So if you have your particular product, whatever it is, you know, the $20, you know, shirt or, you know, the $100 pair of shoes or whatever it is, and you decrease it 100%, you're back to zero. If you decreased it more than that, you'd be negative, right? So we can't have a negative price. And decreasing... more than 100% yields a negative number. So why is it possible then to have an increase in 150% in price? Okay, so can somebody give me, let's do $100 because it's easy to work with. So if I bought a $100 pair of shoes and I increased it 150%, how much would it cost for the pair of shoes? $250. $250 is correct. So when we increase, we're doing an addition step, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and adding something is always possible and adding a positive number anyway, always possible because it doesn't create negative numbers, right? You add something positive and it just keeps going up. It doesn't cause any problems. So we can always add more in price, but can only take off up to 100%. Okay. All right, the last big topic in this section is about interest. Um, and uh, it used to be that we included more in this chapter than we include now. <clears throat> Um, the interest section that's included in this chapter um, was changed, I believe, because it gears more towards the middle school, you know, junior high age down, which is what this is supposed to be geared toward, and not to a high school interest level, which would include compound interest. So we only see the um, simple interest pieces. So these are interest applications in a very specific context. <coughs> so interest. Interest is the amount of money that you pay or earn to borrow or lend money. You know, so we pay interest when we borrow money, we earn interest when we are saving money. Principal is the original amount of the loan or the investment. It's what's being used to determine your interest. All right, so if you put in $100 and somebody else puts in $500, you don't get the same dollar amount in interest because you didn't invest the same amount. Interest rate. The interest rate is the percent that's used to determine interest. It's worth noting that this percent needs to be convert, converted to a decimal. So converted to decimal form. So if you have 7%, we don't put in 7 for R, the interest rate. We put in 0 0.07, right? 7%. Is 0 0.07, for example. We want to make sure we're doing that for percent used. And then the simple interest formulas are as follows. A equals PRT, I'm sorry, P plus PRT, or A equals P1 plus RT. These are two versions for the same formula. They're not two formulas. Okay, the only difference is that the second one has factored a P out. Or you could say if you took the P and you distributed it through, you'd have the first one. Same formulas. So A, P, R, and T. So P is principal. R is the interest rate, as long as you're looking for it in terms of the um, decimal. Um, T in these equations is time. 
And it's really important that you know that this is time in years. So if they start talking to you about how many months they're investing something, you have to turn that into a yearly amount before you start the calculation. Um, and A, A is simply the amount, we'll say later. It's after whatever time we're talking about. It's the amount in six months. It's the amount in five years. It's the, it's the later amount. P is the present amount. <coughs> and interest, the interest specifically, part of the formula above, is the I equal PRT part. So if you're really just trying to find what is the interest, then all you need to do is I equal PRT. Okay, so this interest works for, I mean, this formula would work for interest, it works for tax, it works, it works for anything that you're calculating a percent for over a given time. Okay, so we're going to see a couple different applications of this where it doesn't always say find the interest, but the calculation process is still the same. So here's our first one. Um, a company is expanding its line to include more products. To do so, it borrows $320,000 at 13.5% annual simple interest for a period of 18 months. And then the question at the end says, how much interest will the company be charged? So which formula over here would most directly answer that question? Yeah, I equal PRT, because it specifically asked for interest. Okay, so I is what is unknown. It's what I'm looking for. What is P in this problem? Right, 320000 It's the amount they're borrowing. What is R? Yeah, R is. R is 13.5%. But... I need it in decimal form to put it into the formula, which would give, which would be what? I know 13.5 has a decimal in it, but it also has the percent mark at the end, right? So the percent mark at the end, I have to do something to change it. Huh? Yeah, the decimal point comes first, and then 135, yeah. So the decimal moves two to the left to turn it into a decimal form. So I've got... 135 thousands. That's what that decimal is. <clears throat> and T is time. What's my time? Okay. It is 18 months, but I need it in years, so that would be 1.5. That's <laughs> okay. Okay. 18 months is a year and a half, 1.5 years. And at this point, you're all very grateful that you're not actually in that middle school because that middle school, depending on the school, they may still be multiplying this out by hand. Not joking on that, okay? So grab your calculator. That's what we're going to do. But just recognize that the school's policies do tell you what you have to do when you get there, right? Wherever it is, those calculators are or are not allowed still. What do you get when you multiply 320,000 times... 135 thousandths times 1 and 5 tenths. 64,800. 64, and it should be dollars, right, Jean Ellen? Yep. Okay. So the interest that this company is paying for the luxury of borrowing this money for a year and a half is $64,800. All right, let's look at another one. Again, this is done the same way, but it doesn't have the words interest in it. So because of a recession, the value of a new house depreciated 10% each year for three years in a row. Then for the next three years, the economy began to recover. The value of the house increased by 10% per year. Did the value of the house increase or decrease after the six years? Um, and you might be looking at that and saying, well, it looks like it stayed the same. We're going to calculate to see which one it did because it did not stay the same, albeit it looks like that. Okay. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this problem is that if you'll notice, they don't tell you the value of the house. 
What that means is that you can pick it because it won't make any difference what you pick. The answer will still be the same regardless. So we're going to choose. I'm going to do it right here so more space. Choose, and we're going to very nicely choose a $100,000 house because we get to pick, and it won't matter. So I might as well pick something easy to work with. Ones and zeros are great. Easiest thing to work with. So it starts out at 100000 and on year one, it's going to be decreasing. It's decreasing 10%. Now, the easiest way to do this um, as you're thinking about it is not to think about how much does it decrease, but how much does it stay the same. So you lose 10%, but how much of it do you retain in value? If 10% of it goes away, how much is it worth percentage-wise of what it was worth before? 90, right? 10 goes away, I keep 90% of the price, okay? So I'm going to take that $100,000 house, that's kind of like the P in the principal, and I'm going to multiply it by 90% as a percentage in decimal form. And this is for one year, so if you want to put times one at the end, you may. Um, but you could also just put in times the 0.9 and we'll do it again. So um, this gives me 90,000, right? Everybody good? That's after year one. Year two. Year two doesn't take a $100,000 house and decrease it by 10%. It now takes a $90,000 house and decreases it by 10%. So I do the same process again. What is 90,000 times 0.9 or 0.90? Mm -hmm. 81,000. Going into year three. One more year of decrease. Now I've got an $81,000 house, and I'm probably pretty frustrated. It's going to decrease another 10%. This is our last year of decrease, thank goodness. How much is the house worth at the end of this year? Yep, $72,900. That's so sad. So sad. But it's going to rebound. All right, it's going to come back up. So in year four. In year four, I've got the $72,900 home, but I don't decrease 10%. I increase 10%. So if I go up 10% in price, so this decreased 10% gave me 90. I'm sorry, that was the first one up here, 90. What does the increasing 10% give me? Decreasing took away 10. What will increasing 10 do? It gives 10. So if I have a $100,000 house, I didn't mean $100,000. If I have 100% of value of my house and I increase it 10%, where am I? Y'all are killing me. 110%. Are we good? Okay. I think for a second I like forgot that I could go over 100. Okay. So that's why I just have okay, that's fair. All right. Um, so 90%, we put in decimal form, and we made it 0.9 or 0 0.90. What is 110% in decimal form? 1.1 or, or 1.10, if you prefer, right? Yeah. So instead of multiplying by 0.9, we're going to multiply by 1.1 or 1.10. I'll write it as 10, just so we can still see that 110 maybe showing up in there. So with your calculator, you're going to do 72,900 times 1.1. What do you get after year four? Eighty thousand, uh huh. One ninety. Okay, good deal. Now we're going to go to year five, and we're going to repeat it. But now I have eighty thousand one ninety as the value of my house. That's going up one hundred ten percent. Or it's going up by ten percent. So being multiplied by one point one. What do we get after year five? Very good. And then on year six, we would take the 88,209 and multiply it by the 1.1. And how much do we have? 
Okay. And one of these, it may have been that very last step, we rounded a little bit. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. Um, remember, we chose the 100000 We now have a house worth 97000 Did it increase or decrease in price? It decreased. I mean, we're much happier than we were, you know, halfway through. But it still decreased over time. It's a decrease in price. By what percent did it decrease? Well, that's what B question question B is asking us. Well, it started out at 100,000 and it decreased, that is it went down to 97,029. So this is the value it lost, right? This is our loss. What do you get for this? 3,979. Okay, is everybody good so far? All right, so what is the increase or decrease overall? Well, when we're looking at percents, we can write this per 100. The percent is what we're looking for. The value originally of the house was a $100,000 house. And the top was the 2,000. It's a negative, negative 2,971. It's the value it lost, right? We would cross multiply and divide and so forth. What we would get, kind of going to jump to the, to the end there, is 2.97%. It's a negative, or you can write that it lost 2.97%. It is a decrease. Of, I'm going to say approximately 3%, right? It's approximately a 3% decrease in the value of the house. And the interesting thing was that if you had not chosen a $100,000 house and you had chosen a $150,000 house or a $420,000 house, like, it doesn't matter, this answer would still say 3%. All the work you did on the previous slide would look different. All the numbers would look different, right? The process would be the same, but the numbers would look different, but you'd still, at this point, still get a 3% decrease. Okay. All right. Um, our last example, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you watch it. I'll post the video from last semester because I want you to have time to start some of the group work. It's not crucial to starting the group work. It's a COVID example because I kept COVID data all during COVID. Um, so it's kind of some fun numbers that are being able to be put to get use for this particular problem. So I'll let you watch it later.